Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Great pleasure to see you all uh, this evening. As uh, it's said, I'm, I'm Julian Crampton, Vice Chancellor University of Brighton. It really is a great pleasure to welcome you to the university uh, this evening on the occasion uh, of David Taylor's uh, inaugural lecture as Professor of Social Theory and Social Policy at the University of Brighton. Uh, inaugural lectures uh, are very special occasions at the University calendar. Uh, and uh, before I invite David to talk, us this evening, I'd really like to give you a little background on David's career. He started his undergraduate uh, studies at the University of Bath, graduating in 1974 with a degree in sociology. And subsequently, David continued his studies at the University of Manchester, where he obtained his MA in politics in 1975. Immediately after graduating, he was appointed as a lecturer in sociology at what is now the University of Central Lecture, teaching the sociology of art and literature and open organisational sociology. David moved to London in 1977 to undertake further postgraduate study in the LSE, and he was also appointed as an associate lecturer at what is now at London Metropolitan University. And subsequently, he was appointed as a full-time lecturer, promoted to senior lecturer, then principal lecturer, with a number of really quite important academic leadership roles. And in 1998, David was appointed as the first head of the newly created uh, School of Applied Social Science at the University of Brighton and was appointed Dean of the Faculty of Health and Social Science in 2007. David was awarded the title of Professor in 2009. Now since moving to Brighton, David has done a really a fantastic job, I think, much to promote and provide academic leadership for the School of Applied Social Science and more recently his faculty. And in a moment we'll hear more about his research on welfare and well-being. However, David has also published and been very influential it is exploration of the relationship between the individual and the social in sociology and social policy. Through the development of analytical frameworks for understanding citizenship and social identity and applying psychosocial analyses to policy evaluation. Importantly, David has been a very strong advocate for the social sciences, critically engaging wider audiences. And just one example of this is his pivotal role and long-standing contribution to the development of the journal Critical Social Policy, having joined the editorial collective in the 1980s and having been its production editor for nine years. David is both an outstanding academic leader and an innovative researcher and scholar, an example of that these two important roles can still be combined. And we are all looking forward to hearing what he has to say tonight as I now invite him to deliver his inaugural lecture entitled Welfare and Wellbeing in an Age of Responsibility. David, over to you. Well, thank you, Vice-Chancellor. Thank you, colleagues, distinguished guests, and especially my friends and family for being here tonight. I'd also like to thank the events team at the university for their work in organising tonight's event. Lastly, I must, of course, thank the University Professorial Committee for honouring me with this title. The committee might not have been aware, however, that this is the second time a professorial title has been bestowed upon me. The first was some 35 years ago, when I was, in fact, just starting my academic career as a postgraduate student at the London School of Economics. My friend Simon and I, who I'm pleased to say is here tonight, decided to spend one summer tracing the Nile from its mouth in Alexandria to its source in Burundi. About two to three weeks into that journey, we found ourselves in Upper Egypt, travelling between Luxor and Aswan on a, a third-class ticket on a train, along with goats, chickens, and what seemed like about a thousand other passengers. It was midsummer. I've no idea why we chose to go in July and August. And it was about 120 degrees Fahrenheit. We decided to spend most of the journey sitting on the roof of the train, um, occasionally ducking to miss the telegraph poles as they crossed the tracks, um, and we got very hot and dehydrated. We turned to the only source of liquid that we had at that time, which was an unopened bottle of whiskey. <laughs> we managed to finish it off. The last thing I remember was being back inside the carriage, advancing down it, and falling flat on my face in a semi-comatose state. 
As we arrived in Aswan, Simon thought that I required medical attention and summoned the only available transport at that time, a horse and cart or Egyptian kalesh. Thinking that it would expedite matters, I think, Simon said to the driver, quick, this man needs medical attention. He's a very important professor from a London <laughs> university. I think the clash driver looked at Simon and then looked at me and said, but sir, he's drunk. <laughs> Simon replied, don't worry, they're all like that. <laughs> well, I survived and we made it on to Burundi. But tonight I want to talk about something far more sober. How the application of social theory to the study of social policy can help us understand contemporary debates about welfare and well-being. Along the way, I hope to show a little of how I've contributed to these debates through my own work. And I want to start with a consideration of the recent politics of well-being and happiness. Anyone interested in public policy cannot have failed to notice the growing prominence given to the ideas of well-being and happiness in recent years. Just over 40 years ago now, American Senator Robert Kennedy famously pointed out that economic growth on its own does not tell us anything about individual well-being, or, to use his words, that which makes life worthwhile. Kennedy used an example. A rapid growth in the crime rate leads to increases in the purchases of burglar alarms. This contributes to economic growth, but it is hardly an indicator of increased well-being. Others have used the example of traffic jams, which cause increased petrol consumption, which leads in turn to a growth of GDP, but of course has a negative impact on both the environment and individual well-being. Not all economic growth is good for us or improves our well-being. Within the social sciences, the economist Robert Easterling has shown that over the last 35 years, in affluent countries, and I'm talking here of only affluent countries, there's been a widening gap between average GDP per head and measurements of happiness. Despite continued economic growth, life satisfaction remains stubbornly flat. This has become known as the Easterling paradox. Increases in national wealth beyond a certain point do not lead to increased uh, in reported individual well-being. American economists Daniel Kahneman and Angus Dayton suggest that a high level of income doesn't necessarily make much of a difference either, at least for moment-to-moment -moment happiness. According to their recent work, income over about $75,000 per annum does nothing to improve how much Americans enjoy their activities or how happy they are on a typical day. In 2008, recognising the limits of GDP as a measure, French President Nicolas Sarkozy commissioned Jean-Paul Fetussi, Joseph Stiglitz and Amartya Sen to consider better ways of measuring economic performance and societal progress. In 2009, their commission concluded that governments should shift emphasis from measuring economic production to measuring people's well-being. In the UK, the last parliament, inspired by the work of happiness economist LSE professor Lord Richard Layard of IAPT fame, established an all-party parliamentary group on well-being economics. This aimed to challenge GDP as the government's main indicator of national success. And for some time now, the UK think tank, the New Economics Foundation, has lobbied for the replacement of gross domestic product with a national account of well-being. A situation, incidentally, which has existed in the small Buddhist state of Bhutan since 1972, which measures only GNH, gross national happiness. <coughs> so, when Prime Minister David Cameron announced that following a public consultation by the Office of National Statistics, we in the UK will soon have a new National Happiness Index, and more recently, that all new social and public policy would have to pass a happiness test, should we not be pleased that politicians are looking for a better understanding of social progress and human well-being than simple economic growth. 